In this video, I'm going to give you some hints and tips to get you and your car ready for a UK winter. These hints and tips have been what I've picked up over the last 40 odd years in the motor trade and more recently as a driver. Okay, we'll move on to the next section now. There's just a couple of uh, quick checks inside the vehicle and then we'll move on to another bonnet. So we'll just have a quick look inside the vehicle. Okay, a quick look inside the vehicle. We're going to check for gauges and warning lights. And you might think this isn't that important, but um, if they aren't working and a problem develops, the first thing you're going to know is when you break down. So it's uh, probably worthwhile to make sure they're working. When you turn the ignition on, you should watch out for the oil pressure, battery charging, Engine management lights are all working. Fuel gauge. Um, temperature gauge as well if you've got one. But if, if you've got a temperature gauge and the engine is cold, obviously it won't read. And they should all go out when you start the vehicle up. Now, the only things that's left on is a seatbelt warning and handbrake. Handbrake's off seatbelt will go off if I put the seatbelt on so all gauges are working fine there and very quickly just check the horn and the um, heated rear screen and the heater but we'll need the engine started for that so the horn is working fine um, heated rear screen is working also check that sometimes the light on the switch comes on but it doesn't actually clear the screen so um, just keep an eye on the screen so you, you'd know if it uh, clears you'll see the lines across the back screen and um, you probably know if your heater is not working by now but um, just try your heater um, make sure your heater is working if you get stuck um, for any period of time you're going to need the heater so it's, it's important that it's going to be working right. Well we're on to the under the bonnet section now and this is a quite important section. Um, it's important that you keep on top of this and check it regularly because in the winter everything is hard at the work. The oil is thicker and if something is going to go wrong that's when it's going to go wrong. So we'll start by checking the battery. The battery should be secure. You don't want the battery rattling around, so make sure the battery is secure. Make sure the battery leads are secure. Give them a bit of a tug, see if you can move them. You shouldn't be able to, to move them, they should be solid. There's a lot of technical talk spoken about batteries, like amp hours and um, low temperature cranking and things like that. I don't think for maintenance point of view, you need to know any of that, so I'm not going to go into any of that. Um, older batteries, actually there's not many of them around now, but older batteries used to be maintenance batteries. They used to have little screw top, tops on and you used to have to top them up. Um, you top them up with distilled water, but I haven't seen one of them for a long time, so I, it's more than likely you battery on your car is what they call maintenance free uh, which means there is no maintenance it's great you don't have to top them up it's nearly always written on the top of the battery if it is a maintenance free so I'll just turn the camera around and let you see there's the little sign on the top of my battery maintenance free maintenance free do not open we'll now go to the engine oil um, years ago virtually every engine used to run on 2050 oil and then they went on to 1540 but now there is absolutely loads of different grades of oils so this is one case when you're going to have to um, refer to your owner's manual to find out which oil your vehicle takes in some cases they even change the oil from summer to winter so you must check that and put the correct engine oil in how to check the engine oil. Your car should be on level ground and there will be a dipstick somewhere in the engine. This one doesn't want to come out. Um, take that out 
and wipe the old oil off with a rag. Now, if you can see on the dipstick, you can see the checkered part. The bottom part of the checkered part is the minimum and the top, that one is the minimum and that one is maximum. And your oil should be somewhere in between there. It's better to get nearer the maximum than the minimum, but be careful not to overfill it. Overfill it can cause problems as well. So somewhere in the middle will do. And you see mine is in the middle. Um, don't worry if your oil is black because oils these days are what's classed as detergent oils. And they're just designed to hold the dirt so that when you drain your engine oil off in the service, um, it takes away the dirt as well. So the oil is meant to be black. Um, and the difference, um, obviously different size engines are different, but a rule of thumb is the difference between the minimum and the maximum is a litre. But just do it bit at a time because you don't want to overfill it. Just a little tip when you're filling your oil, if you're topping your engine oil up or filling it if you change the oil, if it's a very slow pourer and you're frightened that it's going to come over the top, um, quite a good tip is to take the dipstick out. It sometimes makes it um, easier to fill. I've just thought to mention your dipstick might not be exactly the same design as mine. Your dipstick might not have the crisscrosses on, it may just have two lines. And it sometimes even says on the dipstick min and max, minimum and maximum. So um, it's pretty obvious when you see it. Anyway, we'll move on to the water, the cooling system now. Um, I was going to say um, it's a good thing before you start doing anything with your cooling system to check for leaks. Radiator, hoses, um, things like that. But on the modern cars, as you can see, you can't see much. You can't see much at all. And for you can't see much for a professional. So um, a new a new driver, a new motorist has got no chance. So what if yours is different to that? Try and have a look for leaks because I'm going to mention antifreeze in a minute and um, if you've got a slight leak on your cone system putting antifreeze in will make it worse. Antifreeze finds the leaks uh, in your in your cone system. So anyway we'll, we'll presume, I know this one hasn't got a leak, um, so we'll crack on. The radiator is, is underneath here, you can't even see it. What you can see here is what they call an expansion tank and uh, it works by the, uh, the little hose on the top of the radiator when the water expands when it gets hot it overflows in the northern days it used to overflow onto the floor but now it overflows into what they call the expansion tank which is pressurized pressurized cap on it so that when the engine cools down instead of there being that little gap on the top of the radiator the uh, expansion tank puts the water back in the radiator so your radiator should be full all the time so you shouldn't need to touch the radiator you just check the expansion tank and never take the top of a cooling system when the engine is hot very dangerous the uh, temperatures can be very high and it will spill out of the top and there's a high risk of getting scalded so um, never take the top off when the engine is hot. Um, there is, um, I'll show you a close up of it in, in a second, there is um, a minimum and maximum mark and most expansion tanks, well every expansion tank that I can think of is perspex, see through, so you don't even need to take the top off. You can normally check the water without taking the top off. Um, I'll just uh, turn the camera around so you can see. Right, this is going to be um, 
quite difficult to show you, I think. Um, there. No. Oh, this is terrible. Um, The maximum mark is there and the minimum mark is about half an inch below it. Very hard to see from here but you would probably see um, better in person than trying to see it through the camera. Um, it should be obvious when you see it anyway. Now it's very important that your cooling system has antifreeze in and most antifreezes can be left in all year round. Um, years ago you had to drain it off in the summer and then refill it in the winter but these days they can normally stay in all year round. Um, but how do you know how much antifreeze you've got in? How do you know if you've got any antifreeze in? Um, there is a little rough um, check that you can do, I don't know whether I tell you or not. It's not uh, what you're supposed to do um what we used to do just as a very rough guide to see if there was any antifreeze in if you take the top off and um just dip your finger in and taste it if it's got antifreeze in it's very very sweet now i'm not saying you should do that um and it's only a very rough way of doing it anyway you uh, can only tell whether, yes, it's got antifreeze in or no, it hasn't got antifreeze in. You can't tell how much. What you normally do, what the garages do, is the use of one of these. It's an antifreeze hydrometer, and it's filled with little beads. There is more sophisticated ones on the market, but it's filled with beads. And you can see it tells you on the side, if one bead floats, it's protected to... Um, minus 7 degrees C plus 20 degrees Fahrenheit two beads would be minus 15 C and so on and what you have to do is take a sample of the um, the water and count how many beads float now I've just noticed this is broken because um, I haven't used it for years so I'm going to try and show you but it might not work I'm going to have to try and um, hold the end in because it's perished. Oh, there we go. Now, you can see mine has got two beads floating. So mine is protected down to minus 15 degrees C which uh, for the UK will be fine um, now most uh, people don't have a antifreeze hydrometer so um, but you can get them now um, they're 6 dollars I looked on the internet last night they're 6 dollars for that for that very one um, but uh, most garages will will pop out and check it for you. I used to do it free all the time when I had the garage. Um, I never charged for it. I did have had to uh, drain the system and refill with antifreeze. I did, but checking it, I used to do free. So most garages will, I think. I'll be very surprised if they charge you. And if they do, it shouldn't be very much. So um, you can either go to get your own tester or um, pop into your garage. Um, I'll tell you what it costs and where to get it later on. Moving on to windscreen washer. Um, it's not always in the same place. Sometimes it's up the top, sometimes it can be anywhere. It's normally a blue cap and it's normally got a little picture of a windscreen on it. Um, and while you can get away with water in the summer I definitely wouldn't recommend water just water in the winter because some of them are hung quite low down and they get 
the ice and slush off the roads and they often freeze up and um, absolutely no use to anybody if they're frozen up. So I would get the windscreen additive. Uh, not only do, will it protect it from freezing, it will have some sort of detergent in it to help get the grime off your screen as well. And um, there's a lot of that in the winter with the uh, spray coming up off the roads. And unlike everything else under the bonnet, there's no minimum maximum with that. You can just fill it to the top. Moving on. Um, brake fluid, brake fluid, stroke, clutch fluid, because some um, some vehicles have got two um, reservoirs, I think most of them have only got one, but some have got two, and you put brake fluid in there, and uh, brake fluid is graded dot and a number, dot three, dot four, um, another time when you're going to have to look at your handbook to see what goes in, dot four, is um, the norm normally. Um, there is um, a minimum and maximum mark on there and um, that one's a really awkward one to top up. Um, but what I'm getting at is you don't overfill it because if you check your brakes and you need to put new pads or even just checking them, you push the pads back. The fluid goes back in there into the reservoir and if you fill it to the brim when you push the pads back to doing maintenance the brake fluid will overflow and brake fluid will take your paint off so uh, you be very careful with uh, brake fluid if you're gonna if there's any chance of it um, spilling out put a rag underneath the um, the master cylinder to catch it because um, as I say it, it will take your paint off and if you ever do um, use a rag to that gets contaminated with brake fluid throw it straight in the bin because if you don't you'll forget about it and there'll be a mark on the wing and you'll rub the mark off and um, you'll damage your paintwork. I'll uh, turn the camera around and try and show you the minimum and maximum marks on the uh, master cylinder. All right, I don't think you're going to be able to see this because I, unfortunately I've only got two hands and I can't hold the screwdriver and the um, light and the camera at the same time. Just where the end of the screwdriver is there, that's the maximum mark. And again, a little bit lower than that is the minimum mark. It's a bit like the uh, expansion tank on the cooling system. And um, as I said with the cooling system, you don't normally have to take the top off. You can give it a shake. Uh, I don't think you can see that, but you can in, when you're here in person. It's it's harder to see in the camera, um, and you can see the fluid moving. Um, that's a particularly hard one to um, to check. Most of them are easier than that. I just thought of something I should have mentioned before uh, when we're talking about the windscreen washer bottle. Um, most cars have got a rear wash wipe as well and um, I don't know what the, the most popular is. Some have got two reservoirs. Some of them have got a reservoir in the boot. I don't obviously don't know what your particular car is. This one's only got one uh, but some cars do have um, a washer bottle in the boot as well. So if your uh, rear wash wipe stops working that might be the reason why you haven't topped up the one for the rear wash wipe. Just thought I'd mention that. Well, just to finish off the under the bonnet section, um, I was going to mention checking drive belts. Uh, used to be called fan belts. But they don't drive the fan anymore. Most fans on the modern cars now are electric. But the belts do drive your alternator and water pump. So um, they are important if they go, but modern engines are so compact now that it's hard enough for the professionals to check them without um, the DIY people. So it's not even worth me trying to show you where they are because you can't see them. They're all down, down here, but you can't see them. So um, sometimes a little indication that a belt is starting to slip is um, a very high-pitched squeal 
on the engine when you rev it up. So if you're getting a high pitch squeal, it could be a belt um, start to slip, but um, unless your car's got more room than this, um, you'd have to take it into a garage to get it sorted, to get it checked. Okay, that's the car maintenance bit finished. Um, you might think, God, I've got to do all of that. It's going to take me ages. It won't. It, uh, it will take less than 10 minutes to do that. It's taken me a lot longer because I've been filming and explaining. When you get, once you've done it a couple of times and you get it, it's dead easy and it won't take long at all. So now we're going to go to um, just little hints and tips that I think might be useful. Um, what should you carry in the boot? Let's have a look. Well, what to carry in your boot? Um, I think what you've got to do here is think about the worst case scenario because nobody expects they're going to break down. Same as their insurance, they don't expect to have their car stolen. But it sometimes happens and when the worst things happen, you should be prepared. So, um, I would say um, a little survival package in your boot which would include warm waterproof clothes, uh, which would include a coat, uh, waterproof shoes or boots, gloves, um, scarf and hat. Um, when you're in extreme weather conditions, your body is very clever. It um, shuts off the blood supply at your extremities to protect the core, which is why your feet, fingers, nose and head get very cold. So um, gloves and scarf and hat are very important. And you might say, I've got plenty of clothes on now. But if you work in a bank or an office or a um, shopping centre where it's nice and warm, you won't be wearing uh, outdoor clothes. So put a little bag in your car and just leave it there. It's only going to be there for two, three months. And uh, forget about it, it's there. Also a picnic blanket uh, would be good. Um, a little pack of um, snacks. Uh, and some water and I um, actually just thought if you're diabetic put some chocolate in or a fizzy drink um, because you can get the, the lows, the, the highs and lows of di being a, a diabetic um, put that in and um, this actually has happened to me um, part of the services I used to provide when I had the garage was a 24 hour breakdown recovery service I was actually on the police uh, list for accidents, stolen cars, breakdowns, things like that. And I've off, not often, it's not, it doesn't happen often, but I have been asked, how long will you be? How long will it take? Because the man is, um, hasn't took his medicines. It does happen. So if you've got regular medicines, it might be worth um, seeing your doctor for some spares and um, leave them in the car as well. Oh, yeah. Most people carry their mobile phones these days. In fact, they don't go anywhere without them. But do they have a means of charging the phone with them? Uh, you hear all the time of a road being blocked and the snowplow can't get to them for 12 hours. Um, so having a spare lead that would plug into your USB in your car would be handy. Now we'll have a look see what I've got in my boot. Uh, I always used to carry um, a shovel. If you get stuck in the snow, um, you might be able to dig yourself out. Um, much better than waiting six hours for a breakdown truck to come, if you could help yourself. Um, a torch because it, it might well be at night. Um, this torch is a fantastic torch. It, uh, it can work like that or you get a better light if you do it like that. It's a real good torch but uh, it was £22 I think. But it's rechargeable batteries and um, it's got a good battery life. Uh, real good one. If you take care of it, £22 will last for years. Um, another thing is, um, you don't know where you're going to 
break down. Hopefully you're not going to break down, but you, but you never know. You could have a little bump or you could have a breakdown and you could be stuck somewhere. A lot of people survive the initial little bump or the breakdown only to get out of the car, the scene of the breakdown, and be bumped by a passing car. So it might be at night, it might be in the fog, it uh, might be raining, it might be freezing cold. I carry that with me. And this is, a, again, it's a padded one. It's, it's really warm and it's high vis. And um, that was about 40 pounds though. So if you didn't want to splash out of that and you had another coat, you could, could get a vest. Now these vests are only £2.50 or something, I think. Um, they're not very expensive and it just goes over the top of your ordinary coat, but at least you'll be seen. Um, that's the critical thing, being seen so that you're not knocked over when you get out of the car um, or you're waiting for the breakdown truck or you're waiting for the police or whatever that. Be seen. Something else that might be uh, useful and is very simple and very cheap is um, keep a notepad and pen in the car. You never know when you need to make, give someone your details or take their details. It's just handy to have. Just a couple of tips to finish off with now. Um, before you set off in the morning on a on a snowy icy morning um, just take a little bit longer to cre clear your windscreen um, you often see those people driving around and they've, they've cleared that much off their windscreen and they're driving around and five minutes longer you could have cleaned it properly just think how you'd feel if you'd knock someone over and killed them you'd have that guilt for the rest of your life for the sake of taking five minutes longer this last piece of advice, I have to be very careful what I'm saying. Um, people don't like to be criticised about their driving, especially the men. It's like saying they're no good at sex or they can't call their drink. But I say it every day, um, absolute crazy driving. I'm cut up every day in the bus without fail. Every day I'm cut up just so someone can gain a couple of yards. It's well documented that uh, the two main reasons for accidents are firstly speed and secondly driving too close to the car in front and as I say I see it every day. Um, even pulling up behind somebody in a queue to get right up the bumper. Um, when I was being trained for the ambulances um, a traffic police, police instructor was taking the course and um, he had a little rhyme which I thought was quite good and it's always stuck in my mind. It's uh, tyres and tarmac. So um, if you're pulling up to a vehicle in front of you and you can't see their tyres and a little bit of tarmac, you're too close. So he used to say tyres and tarmac. And uh, I've remembered it. Okay, I think I'm about done. <laughs> Um, I've bound to have forgot something, um, but hopefully I've covered the main bits and um, I've got a feeling this is going to be much longer than I expected, so it might have to go out in um, one or two, two or three um, videos. Uh, I'll see where, how long it is when I've done the editing. Um, but I hope, uh, I hope you've got something out of it, even if you're a seasoned motorist, I hope you've got something out of it. And um, if you're a new motorist, um, you've probably got more out of it. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And if it's been helpful to you, it's your turn now. You can be helpful for me <laughs> by subscribing to my channel. Um, you take care. Till the next time. Thanks for watching.